Uh, my name is Jim Lewis. Welcome to CSIS. We have a great panel this morning. Um, we hoped that this could be more of an interactive session, so the panelists are going to talk for five or ten minutes. I think we told them ten. And then we want to get an exchange going with the audience, so feel free to throw in your questions, your remarks, your comments. Uh, we'll do that up here as well. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, ask uh, David, my uh, co-conspirator uh, in this event, uh, to talk about the chapter. And Hi, my name is David Viorst. I'm the co-convener of the Washington, D.C. chapter of the Internet Society. How many of you are familiar with the Internet Society? Very good. Then you know that the Internet Society is a global organization on the forefront of maintaining a free and open Internet amidst very significant challenges to that model. Um, the D.C. chapter, we see our role as, as where the rubber hits the road in D.C. In, in taking that message and taking those things and advocating for that in D.C. We'd love to get more people involved. We'd love to have any of you involved in the chapter. I'd like all the people involved with the chapter to raise their hands now. Great. Come and see any of us if, if you're interested in being more involved. And I'll turn the discussion back over to Jim. I know, it's been a long week, hasn't it? I can't wait for the three-day weekend. Um, I'm really glad we're doing this, and we started talking sort of among ourselves. That was the genesis of this idea, because um, I go to meetings now where I hear sort of a common refrain, and I was talking to Mike Nelson at the beginning about this. When um, the U.S. started uh, thinking about commercializing the Internet, we kind of split uh, governance and security in some ways. And what's happened is they've come back together now, right? And some of the ideas that we had for governance from the 1990s, uh, unipolar world, the end of conflict, everyone would be a market democracy, borders were going away. And those turned out not to be right. So we're, we're working with a 1990s construct that um, many other governments uh, aren't comfortable with. And that's part of why we're here. Why are they uncomfortable with it? And when you talk to them, um, there's a whole set of reasons, which I'm sure the panelists will discuss. But um, we have a problem. So the benefits, there are benefits. This will be strange for me to say. There are benefits to the multi-stakeholder model, right? We need to figure out a new way to make the case for that. The old case is no longer persuasive. And this isn't me saying this. This is what I hear from other governments. So how will we change? And how will we guide change? How will we survive change in a way that preserves the good features of the multi-stakeholder model and preserves the built-in commitment to human rights that you see in the internet? Because there are people who have an alternative model for governance that would produce some very different results. And to complicate the story, I know some of the panelists will talk about this as well. Phil certainly knows this very well. We have new players. We have people who weren't present 20 years ago, the Brazils, the Indias. They have different views. They have different attitudes. So change is unavoidable. I don't think we're talking about a new narrative here. I've been guilty of saying that like everyone else. We're not talking about a new narrative. We're talking about a new model, right? So what does that new model look like? How do we guide change? What do we want to see as a good outcome? And with that, let me just briefly uh, introduce the panel. David, you already know. Uh, he and I will co-moderate which means that when one of us looks dozy, the other one will give him an elbow. Um, <laughs> Phil Verveer, who is a, a true leader in the field, uh, former uh, US coordinator at the State Department, and um, did a great job. So, but then escaped, which is always a good thing from state. We're very happy to have you here. Uh, Vanny Markowski, uh, known to most people, uh, Vice President for Russia, CIS, CIS. Do they even use that phrase anymore? CIS and Eastern Europe for ICANN. Uh, Jane Coffin, who we're very happy to have here, uh, Director of uh, Development Strategy at the Internet Society. Development turns out to be really crucial, and development turns out to be where the swing boats are, right? So when you talk to 
the you, you know you have a Western bloc and you have an authoritarian bloc, and the middle group is the biggest, and what they care about is development. So important to hear about that. Bill Smith, technology evangelist at PayPal and a longtime veteran of these discussions, uh, even longer than me, which is really startling, right? Um, and finally, Laura Denardis, who's a professor at American University and specializes uh, in these fields. And Laura, we're very happy to have you here today. So with that, why don't we go down the row? Each of the panelists will speak, as I said, for about five or 10 minutes. We'll start with Phil, and then we'll open it up to discussion. Okay, well, thank you, Jim. Um, uh, I've been asked to uh, try to describe a little bit uh, the uh, present geopolitical context for uh, issues of internet governance. Uh, and um, as you can appreciate in the course of 10 minutes, I'm going to engage in a lot of very crude generalizations, uh, none of which are intended to uh, insult any of the uh, entities or countries that, uh, that I might mention in the, in the context of this. Uh, obviously, we begin, uh, as uh, you all know, with a multi-stakeholder history that goes back now uh, at least to the commercialization of the Internet and perhaps before. It has um, uh, the uh, very decided uh, attractive aspect that it's been extremely successful, that from a pragmatic perspective it is something that has worked very well. It also happens to correspond uh, with something that's happening uh, very decidedly in the wider world of geopolitics, and that is the great significance of non-state actors, the uh, importance of uh, uh, international corporations, of uh, NGOs, uh, other uh, uh, academic institutions that are now spreading beyond their, uh, their initial national um, uh, origins, um, uh, and also some considerably less benign international activities, international criminal activities, um, and of course uh, terrorist organizations. So it turns out that this, uh, this aspect of, of the significance of non-state actor is one of the uh, very, very significant uh, contextual things that we have an opportunity to talk about. That said, um, uh, the foundation of international cooperation continues to be the nation state. Um, we have um, uh, adhered to the agreements that were reached in Westphalia in 1648. We continue to do that. Um, it is not something that's going to go away anytime soon. Uh, it is certainly the case that um, uh, from the standpoint of many of the kinds of things that we're going to have to address with respect to Internet governance, that we are going to continue to rely very, very decisively on uh, the nation state. But when it comes to international organization or nations organizing themselves, um, it's also important to recognize that the United Nations and the architecture that the uh, greatest generation left for us, a one nation, one vote architecture, is something that we have to also incorporate when we think about changes in internet governance. This is something that's extraordinarily important because uh, for many countries, as I'll try to address very briefly, um, the United Nations and its organizations are the central uh, place where they want to go to resolve any kind of um, important uh, international matters. Uh, and the one nation, one vote aspect of that is, is not so incidental in terms of, um, in terms of their interest in it. Um, let me just reflect very briefly on this multi-stakeholder process. It creates challenges of the kind that Jim uh, mentioned. It is, it is a kind of interesting and important top-level uh, proposition, but it is very important to try to get to the level of detail. Um, the, we really don't have a definition of the multi-stakeholder process. Uh, I tend to think of it as a kind of ethos of inclusivity, which doesn't... Um, doesn't provide much other than guidance in terms of the notion that to the extent that uh, inclusivity is possible, we ought to try to achieve it. Um, but there are a lot of specific contexts where we have to try to come to a, a much clearer, much better understanding about how we're going to enable participation and what the limits of, those, uh, of uh, broad participation may be. Now, I want to, I want to um, sort of conclude by uh, talking a little bit about some of the issues that I think are raised in the, in the context of Internet governance, the specific issues that are raised, and why we were sort of brought to the point where this is going to have to be a significant part of our conversation going forward. When the United States advances what is essentially a status quo preference in terms of Internet governance, 
the following kind of suspicion pervades the, um, the discussion. Um, so whenever I in the past represented the United States in issues of Internet governance, my interlocutors, whether they were hostile or friendly, almost certainly were thinking the following. I understand what you're saying. The United States created the Internet. The United States controls the Internet. United States corporations profit disproportionately from the Internet. And United States security services have privileged access to everything that traverses the Internet. Now, it is, it is a very serious mistake for us uh, to go into any discussions of these things without recognizing that that is a reality that is um, uh, one that, um, as I say, uh, is something that I think probably is an important reflection for both those who are very friendly to us and those who are less friendly. Uh, secondly, uh, we have to recognize that the Internet has become a mechanism of overarching importance to every country in the world both in terms of its economic uh, activity, of course, but also in terms of social, political, and cultural considerations. And um, yet, for many countries, there's no reliable modality that permits them to influence, let alone control, what happens. Uh, and in this regard, uh, you often will hear controversies uh, uh, involving ICANN uh, being raised by other countries um, and the, uh, the continuing Commerce Department contract uh, is, uh, is something that often uh, comes to the fore. A uh, third thing to consider is that the content conveyed over the Internet largely reflects um, U.S. legal and cultural sensibilities. Um, uh, and these sensibilities, uh, to understate the case, are not universally shared. So that there, there is certainly in, in many societies um, a sense that um, uh, our, from their point of view, very permissive attitudes about content are things that, uh, that they regard as, as utterly inappropriate for their societies. And fourth, uh, cybersecurity is a large and growing problem. Uh, and there's very substantial uncertainty on the part of many countries about how to address uh, the cybersecurity uh, issues. Now, let me finish by just kind of quickly summarizing what I think the positions, broadly speaking, of, um, of the countries that uh, are in the, in the debate uh, uh, happen to be. Um, for the Western countries, and Japan, Kenya, and others, um, there is a preference for the status quo. That preference is based on the, the uh, desire to continue the organic growth of the Internet, its evolution, uh, pursuant to technological change, to uh, changes in business model, to changes in consumer preference, and also um, the commitment that these countries have to freedom of expression, the free flow of information, uh, generally uh, a desire to um, uh, uh, permit uh, free speech to avoid political repression, things of that nature. Secondly, however, there are countries that regard the Internet as an existential threat, literally as a threat that is immediate to them. Uh, in, th in this regard, the lessons of Tunisia, the lessons of Egypt, whether, whether in fact these are correct uh, lessons or not, are, or at least correctly interpreted lessons, are things that are very much in the forefront of the imagination of many regimes around the world. It is literally an issue of uh, the existence, the continuing ex existence of these regimes. Third, there are countries, and here most notably probably Russia and China, that cannot reasonably regard the Internet as any sort of an immediate existential threat, but nevertheless regard it as a threat. Um, now, if you're going to be, um, uh, I think, to try to be fair about this, uh, part, of, part of their concerns reflects a deep-seated anxiety about disorder in these societies. Um, and part of it obviously reflects, uh, again, the notion that um, regime change or impinging on the uh, on the uh, prerogatives of the regime are something that it will be regarded as very unwelcome. And in this regard, then, Russia and China, in particular, in terms of many of the Internet governance issues, take a leading role. Fourth, there are countries, as Jim mentioned, like Brazil, India, that have um, uh, a whole set of concerns about the Internet. They need it. They want it to work for them. They, however, also uh, feel, I think, rather acutely that they don't have nearly as much influence in terms of how the Internet may, uh, may evolve as their position in the world uh, uh, entitles them to. 
Um, these are countries, among others, that have a strong preference for bringing issues to the United Nations, having them resolved within the framework of the United Nations. Um, and that uh, uh, creates, as I said, in part because of the traditional architecture of the United Nations, uh, creates some, uh, some significant challenges, especially for the multi-stakeholder um, uh, proposition. And finally, there are a lot of countries in the world for whom the big issue really is development. It is the question of whether or not there are ways that can be, um, uh, uh, ways we can approach Internet governance that will help them in terms of extending their broadband, uh, uh, their broadband networks, in terms of uh, uh, being able to improve their cybersecurity environment, a whole range of development issues that um, they would like to see improvement, uh, uh, where they'd like to see improvement occur. So I think that, that to some extent, then, I, I hope, um, uh, gives us some some notion of the broad geopolitical <coughs> environment, and I look forward to our discussion. Thanks, Bill. <coughs> Benny, Shall please. I? Thank you. I'll take the, the the last words of Phil to make a couple of comments, actually, uh, before I get into the details. So, first of all, uh, yes, I am the Vice President of ICANN for Russia and CIS, but uh, we're here in Washington, D.C., so, you know, don't take my words as uh, relevant to the situation in Washington. And my background is that I was born in Macedonia and raised in Bulgaria, so I moved to the U.S. recently, relatively recently, but I hear completely and I agree with the development uh, wording about what the Internet is about. And I'll share some experience with you just so that you know uh, and for the folks here who, uh, who can choose between uh, their internet provider, between the phone company and the cable company, you may be uh, interested to know that uh, in developing country Bulgaria, uh, there are more than 2,000 internet service providers for 7 million people population. So you basically choose between those 2,000 providers, not between two. The result is that uh, you can buy one gigabit connection at home for 15 US dollars a month and not one mega megabit connection for 50 US dollars that you do at Capitol Hill in Washington. Uh, the, uh, but we did it because we, the, we did it for two reasons. Uh, we did it because the government did not interfere into the internet business. They tried back in 1999. They introduced licenses for internet operators, and that made, um, that made us very unhappy. Uh, we were the internet community, the internet society of Bulgaria, and the internet operator, so we challenged the government in the Supreme Court, and we won. And as a result, since then, Bulgaria is given as an example to any of those ITU slash UN related uh, meetings as uh, how the internet could actually develop. Now, with regards to the geopolitics uh, of internet governance, uh, I don't know how many people here speak other languages, but the term governance in some languages cannot be translated, including, by the way, in the country of uh, Russia where I'm uh, working a lot. So we have a serious issue of explaining what internet governance means to people who uh, affiliate governance only with government. Uh, we also have a problem with uh, explaining what multi-stakeholder means because we talk about, you know, the Internet is being governed in a multi-stakeholder way, but uh, it's very difficult to explain what it means and how is it possible that the government, the private business, the academic world and the civil society can actually work together. I mean, in some countries around the globe, some of those words are actually almost like a verdict. Uh, now, going back to, to some of the items that were mentioned and some of the items that I'm sure my colleagues here will also talk about, uh, we believe, when I say we, I mean basically the broader kind of non-Western community. We believe that education is key, but education and, and um, development not only bringing the Internet into the rest of the world, after all, only two billion people are online some of the estimates are, and that means five billion probably have never used the internet. Um, education and development means also to go and educate governments what the internet is. Not only governments, but also intergovernmental organizations like the ITU. 
Uh, we have had some anecdotal examples, um, and I can share with you because I've been sitting on the Bulgarian governmental delegation for the last 10 years at the ITU. There are some, some anecdotal evidence that even within the ITU, the people who come there are not quite familiar with what the Internet is about. Um, some of you may be aware that um, the internet, you, most of you write google.com or whatever you write on your um, screen and you visit the website, but uh, some of you know that there is actually a, a, a numbers behind this name, uh, IP addresses, they are called internet protocol addresses. So there is a version which is expiring already, there are 4 billion plus uh, IP version 4 addresses and there is a new protocol developed which is called IP version 6. And it, it's huge. It's so huge that if you put all the, web, all the IP addresses from the old version uh, into a space which is as big as a uh, tennis ball, the IPv6 addresses will be as big as the sun. So that's the, that's the relation between the two. So some people, and I'm not going to mention names or countries just because it's not fair, but some people have said that uh, they want the ITU to become, to distribute such IP addresses, and they said, well, Let's give the ITU one trillion IP addresses, which it can distribute to developing countries. Now, when you compare four billion to one trillion, clearly it's a big difference. The detail that was not known then was that you cannot actually have one trillion IP addresses, because the smallest segment of IPv6 addresses that you can get consists of 18 million blocks, and each of these blocks has one trillion addresses. So this is, when I talked about education, this is what we need to do and what the internet community as a whole needs to do. We need to basically bring our knowledge. And for some of us here, it's like, oh, but it's obvious. You know, how can you not know that? But there are five billion people who have never used the internet and for them, the whole concept about the internet is not known. They don't know what this is. And even for the two billion who are using the internet, um, and for governments which are in countries which are far ahead of uh, everyone else, like I can name my favorite Estonia, which um, is using the internet in their, not only in their daily activities, but uh, they do their elections online. And for some reasons unknown to me, coming from Bulgaria or to anyone here in the US, we don't do that. We don't really have online elections. And if uh, whenever I've been raising this issue, uh, there are always people who say, oh, you don't know, it's going to be so much fraud and some hacker from an unknown country may hack into the system and change the result of the election. And I said, well, what happened in 2000 in the US, you know, wasn't this, <laughs> in a way, with no need of a hacker to do it? So, so I think, I mean, with all my respect, because, you know, I, I don't know really the history. I only know what I see in the movies about this uh, <laughs> year 2000. So I think um, the, the problem that I see about the uh, geop geopolitics of Internet governance is that there are several groups, and uh, Philippe Vivier mentioned some of them, uh, there are several groups of countries slash societies which think about the internet one way, and then there is another group which is thinking about the internet in a different way. Where is, where is the agreement between those? I don't know. But what I know is that the only way to reach some kind of agreement is to sit and talk. Um, it's been amazing to see how people who don't know, for example, what ICANN is, and they have been coming to me and way in the beginning, right, the first time I went to Russia in 2006, uh, as member of the ICANN board back then, and people would come and tell me, so who in ICANN controls the button that can shut down the Russian internet? And today, when you talk to people in Russia, they actually know there is no button. They know that no ICANN nor any other organization can shut down the Russian internet. Uh, they know already there are examples of other countries shutting down the whole internet for the whole country and doing it in the name of national security or or actually, there is a much easier example. You know, you are a country somewhere where you only have one connection going outside of the country to connect to the internet, and you know, somebody cuts this line. There was a case in Georgia a couple of years ago when an old lady digging her garden cut the cable. <laughs> I mean, this is like nobody could have expected it. So I, to, to 
end up, and I, I'm hopeful that there will be, I'm hope that there will be questions. I think um, there are so many perceptions and so many uh, thoughts about what the internet is and who controls it that people forget often that uh, something which actually a Russian journalist wrote in an article in, in one article in 2007 that the question is not who controls the internet, the question is what controls the internet, because and he was making a case that it's the protocols and the standards that actually control the internet. Thank you. Thanks, Fanny. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Um, I am. Uh, I was in Armenia at the time when the cable was cut by the little old lady who was doing the gardening, and the internet did go down for a week. <laughs> um, also, construction projects used to take the internet down, and I would be asked often by my colleagues at the regulatory body, what happened? And I think, how do I explain this? Um, so the debate back then and now is different in broadening, and I'm startled like Jim. I was at the 1998 Plenty Potentiary in Minneapolis, where resolutions 101 and 102, which have floated around for many, many years, were created. And at that moment, the debate was not with the countries that Ambassador Revere has articulated a little bit with some of the, the former uh, Soviet republics, the CIS and Russia. It was the United States, Europe, Japan, Australia, Canada, fighting over the word gestion, which in French is management of the internet. Um, it was a fascinating debate at that time because we were just trying to keep the, the, the discussions manageable at that time. And as many of you know, the debate has broadened, and as Kathy Brown from Verizon said last week in Geneva at the WTPF, the World Telecom uh, Policy Forum, the debate has matured. But to tag on to a point made by Ambassador Revere, have we matured our education and our outreach with those countries? Recently, I was in Macedonia, Tunisia, Colombia, and at the WTPF, almost in that order. It's been a long four weeks, but in Macedonia, I was at a meeting that, um, run by the Regional Internet Registry for uh, Europe, the CIS, and um, the Arab states, RIPE. And we were talking to southeastern European countries about the need for internet exchange points, keeping local traffic local, bringing down costs, all part of the WISIS Tunis Agenda, paragraph 50. How do you broaden out the international internet connectivity, but through your local connectivity as well? I'm a keen advocate of internet exchange points and focus on that at the Internet Society. Some of my colleagues um, from RIPE and I were chatting about the debate being almost a debate that was had 15 years ago with some of our colleagues from Southeastern Europe. That is not to say that these are not highly intellectual, intelligent people who know how to build infrastructure. The debate is, as our um, Ambassador Revere and Veni have articulated, we have a vernacular that we've been using since 1998 that has grown up, the multi-stakeholder model. A, d a word that, quite frankly, as a colleague of mine in Thailand has pointed out, that the government there would not understand. By the way, what is the stake? When I lived in Armenia, talking to the Armenians, I'd say, well, the stakeholders, and they'd look at me and say, are you talking about food? Or are you talking about <laughs> steaks, the things you put in your garden? Um, we have a vernacular that we've developed as certain debates have matured about internet governance, but are we now excluding countries who have matured their own debates in their countries? Mm -hmm. Colombia, the reason I bring it up, the, uh, the minister from Colombia was at the meeting that I was at, noted that the internet was so important to him <coughs> that it's a poverty alleviation device. It's a way to create jobs. It's a, a, a way to level the playing field. He wasn't going after technology. He has left that to the technologists, to the Regional Internet Registry, the meeting I was at, the LACNIC meeting in Colombia. How is it that we have governments in South America who are now focused and perhaps have a more sophisticated approach than we might have about building the internet, working with stakeholders or collaborators, if you will, coordinating, collaborating, cooperating, um, trying to build their infrastructure, but realizing that they too want a role? The Brazilian government wasn't at the meeting in Colombia but the Brazilian um, registry, cgi.br, nic.br, very sophisticated internet exchange point uh, development. They hand out the IP addresses in, the, in Brazil. An incredible force in South America and in the OAS groups that we participate in through governance and um, discussion of amplification of infrastructure, building that infrastructure, the debates about IPv6, IXPs. Brazil, at the WTPF last week, the government was there. They want to roll at the table. They're probably the US's fifth or sixth largest trading partner. 
they are a huge force to be reckoned with. Highly sophisticated, working closely with the internet technical community in Brazil, building out undersea cables to Africa. How, is, how are traffic patterns gonna change? Will Brazil now be a hub? Have we thought about this? Those are geopolitics of traffic management, of the internet, of money, quite frankly. Let's talk about, let's be honest. Um, is Brazil now asking us, we want a seat at the table? I would posit absolutely. Look at the p opinion they put forward. A role for stakeholders, a role for government, a role for the ITU. The discussion about internet governance is hot wired into the ITU fabric right, fabric right now. There is a working group in the ITU Council mm -hmm which is all about internet public policy issues. So are we being a bit naive to say that the debate can't, we can't discuss the internet? We're not supposed to talk about internet governance at the ITU? And are we bypassing very key trading partners, geopolitical partners? Brazil is one of the most sophisticated cybersecurity teams in the region. They've done a lot to build out cyber um, incident response teams throughout South America, the Caribbean, and um, uh, Central America. Do we partner with them? And do we try and listen to what they have to say? The WICIT, the World Conference on International Telecommunications, where much of this hit the road, was a very difficult debate. WTPF continued that debate, but in a more sophisticated fashion. The ITU tried very hard to include more stakeholders. So I would posit a couple questions just uh, for us to think about as we discuss among the panel a bit more. How does the ITU continue to attempt to include stakeholders? How can they do that through the fabric of their policy and procedures? Is it, is it as robust as some of the, we're a non-state actor at the Internet Society. We've been involved in development of infrastructure policy and governance for 20 something years. A lot of people don't realize that. How is it that we can encourage the debate and as Fanny has said, continue an education that is inclusive? This is not going to stop. We also have the UNGA where the debate will continue over the next two years. We have something called the World Telecom Development Conference in Mar uh, March or May, I think, in Sharm el -Sheikh. Countries will come together at the WTDC to prepare for what is known as the Plenipot, the Plenipotentiary Conference of the ITU. And I'm focusing in on the ITU because I was just there. I've been involved in it for many years. I've stepped out of that role, quite frankly, in the last couple of years. But it came back full force last week. We can't ignore it. We can't ignore that debate. We can't ignore the fact that it is an intergovernmental organization where there is a mandate to have this discussion. How do we have the debate with governments as well where we don't create the, um, the idea that the internet is a shiny object they must control and manage? I could say shiny object because I, again, preoccupation with internet exchange points, helping develop them around the world with my colleagues. They have become a shiny object. Oh, they're fascinating. We should control them. There's deep packet inspection going on at all axis. I'm like, no, no, yikes, okay. <laughs> We're talking about local traffic, local. We're talking about building out infrastructure. Deep packet inspection is not part of the fabric of what we're doing at Internet Exchange Points from the Internet Society's perspective. There may, that may be happening in other countries, but to Venny's point about V6, which Bill and I had to fight uh, off in the ITU years ago, how do you explain it to someone that doesn't know what an IP address is? numbers, it's very confusing for some people and they think, well, I want some. And you think, okay, great. <laughs> you can have some, you've got to go talk to X, Y, and Z. But where do you get these addresses? How do we create the debate, uh, fashion the debate so that there's an understanding about the important role of ICANN, a, co a colleague, a, an important colleague of the Internet Societies and the ISTAR community, the regional internet registries. And as Ambassador Revere has said, we can't keep bypassing this debate about almost stepping back and saying, we have created this vernacular, we've created a world around internet governance, but are we being a bit, I don't want to say rude, but are we being obnoxious and not stepping back and saying, these developing countries, emerging markets, have a role, they need to be included in this debate, how do we do it? We're very keen to go out and build infrastructure at the Internet Society, but we have realized through our chapters, and thanks to David for this great uh, exercise here, but also Veni, who's with the chapter in Bulgaria, for the WICKET and the WTPF, the Internet Society broadened its own process. We are trying to figure out how, to be how better to work with our chapters. We have 94 around the world. How to work with them to speak with governments at their level about the local problems, the international challenges, and what this means in a broader fabric. It takes a lot of time. This isn't a debate or a discussion that can be had in five minutes, five hours. It's a continuing debate. I would just also posit that perhaps we do need to listen more to what our colleagues are saying around the world. And we just can't expect them to take the OECD principles. Sure, great, there are these internet principles. Okay, 
should we take them? Thank you very much, but we didn't adopt them, create them, have a role in making them. So why would they adapt them? We have to help them work through that. Is that something we can do? Same with other principles we know to be core to what we're doing at the Internet Society. We know we have to broaden the debate. We have to find better ways to do it, and we have to include other stakeholders. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Bill, please. So I'm going to uh, probably repeat a number of things that have already been said. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, sort of Internet governance on the world stage, things that have happened recently. Um, this will be acronym soup. Uh, you've heard most of them already. So in December of 2012, we had the Wicket. We had WTPF last week. We have the ITU plenipotentiary in the fall of 2014. And for those of you who haven't brushed up on your Latin, plenipotentiary means all-powerful. Right? So whoever shows up there is all-powerful for their government um, and can decide anything. Um, and then the Internet Governance Forum, or the IGF, that happens this fall and every fall. Um, each of these, either directly or indirectly, derives its authority from the Tunis Agenda of 2005, or so it's claimed. Okay. The reason you'll get, you'll see why I say that. And as Phil mentioned, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll, I'm going to be pretty blunt in my uh, um, in my approach here, though that's my normal way anyway. Um, computer scientists and engineers prefer very precise terms, as in RFC 2119, terms like shall, must, may, should. Right? They have very definite definitions. Okay, you can understand them. Diplomats prefer ambiguity and interpretation. That's how they reach agreement, and you'll see that with things like phrases like where appropriate, okay? That, that will be inserted before something where somebody wants to do X, and somebody says, well, no, I don't want you to do X, but we don't have time to figure it out, so, well, we'll put where appropriate in, and then we'll debate that later. Um, <laughs> the Tunis Agenda is a diplomatic instrument. It is 122 paragraphs um, of diplomatic language, and it is open to uh, significant interpretation. I believe it's, it's actually not the root of the problem we have for Internet governance, but there are issues back in there that have never been resolved. As an example, the roles and responsibilities for the various constituents. I'll try to avoid stakeholder. Government, civil society, private industry, the technical, Internet technical community. Our roles are not specified in there, except Governments are supposed to decide international internet public policy. But that phrase isn't defined either. So we don't know where that starts, where it stops. And as we know, policy bleeds all over in the internet. I'll get to that in a bit. Um, there is one, and only really one, organization that's named in the Tunis Agenda, and that's the ITU with respect to internet government, governance. It is mentioned three times. The IGF, as a concept, is introduced or it's carried over from a, a prior document. The IETF, ICANN, IANA, the RIRs, ISOC are all notably absent. They are not mentioned. The ITU relies on this, I believe, to claim a preeminence in this space and to say, we're mentioned, we are the intergovernmental agency responsible for doing internet governance. To the point that in 2011, I believe, I think it was 11, the ITU Council, which is the governing body between plenipotentiary conferences, um, established the uh, internet uh, group that Jane mentioned, and they're going to discuss 12 things in internet governance, and, oh, sorry, internet public policy. <laughs> Multilingualization of the internet, including internationalized domain names. They have nothing to do with domain names, but they, this, they're going to discuss it. International internet connectivity. They have a role to play here. Mm. However, if they have a role to play here and connectivity is lacking, who is to blame? Well, that would be the ITU, <laughs> because that is their role. <laughs> International public policy, policy issues pertaining to the internet and the management of internet resources, including domain names and addresses. Again, this is not their space. Those discussions should happen at ICANN. The security, safety, continuity, sustainability, and robustness of the internet. There are organizations that, in fact, do this. There are a number of certs. There's an organization called FIRST. Again, this should more properly occur elsewhere, in my opinion. Combating cybercrime. We have the Budapest Convention. We have uh, the Commonwealth nations have put together things. Again, other places to talk about these issues. These are law enforcement issues. These ha affect private industry. The 
ITU does, has no expertise in this space. Dealing effectively with spam. This came up and was a huge issue at the Wicket. It's been dealt with in many, any number of ways um, outside of the developing world. As Jane points out, we need to educate people about this. We have not done an adequate job there, but spam can be dealt with. We, we will never make it go away, okay? But no amount of language in an international treaty will make it go away either. So we, we have to educate. Talking about it at the ITU is not gonna help. There are active things that we can do. Issues pertaining to the use and misuse of the internet. Now there's a broad term, right? I think they really mean misuse. Um, availability, affordability, reliability, quality of service, especially in the developing world. Again, this is something the ITU is uh, in its charter is supposed to focus on if there is an issue here, they only need to look within themselves to find the root cause. Contributing to capacity building in developing countries, again, developmental aspects of the internet, again, it's the ITU, so these are appropriate. Respect for privacy and the protection of personal information and data. I don't know of a working group inside or a study group inside the ITU that actually works on this. They have no privacy experts. Um, it, would be, it is, I believe, largely inappropriate to have this discussion going on there. Protecting children and young people from abuse and exploitation. I will be the first one to stand up that, and say that we should be doing things to protect uh, children from abuse and exploitation. I don't know that the IT was the best place to do it. They have a program ongoing there. It's, it's, I think it's fine for them to do it, but they're, again, this is an issue not of the internet, it is an issue of the people who create this material, who abuse the children, mm -hmm. et cetera. That's where the focus needs to be, not on technology. So if we're going to really have a discussion about um, moving forward on, on geopolitics and, and uh, internet governance, I agree we have to engage at places like the ITU. They clearly want to discuss any issue related to the internet. And the internet community goes there. We fight basically a rear guard defensive action against what, what is happening and largely to ensure that no harm is done. Uh, but we need to be more proactive uh, with a more forward looking strategy. Um, and I'd like to recall Phil's description of the perception of the United States with respect to the internet, that we have a controlling, uh, somehow the United States controls <coughs> what goes on in the internet and in its governance. Um, that perception um, is in fact, it's, it's not real, but perception is reality. So from the other side, that is reality, regardless of what any of us who work in this space believe. I'm gonna suggest that there's something that ICANN can do and governments can do with the affirmation of commitments. The affirmation of the commitments is a set of promises made ostensibly between the United States Department of Commerce and ICANN. Um, so superficially, it's a bilateral document. It reads like a, an agreement. It says that it's an agreement. However, if you deconstruct it just a bit, you find that it's really just two unilateral covenants. The Department of Commerce is making a set of promises, and ICANN is making a set of promises. They happen to be in the same document. And I suggest, I submit, that this could become a multilateral or multiple unilateral instruments where multiple governments sign up and make a set of promises to ICANN, as the Department of Commerce and the US government did, and that ICANN in return makes the same promises back to those governments and to the community. And that by doing this, we could at least start down a path where we get governments saying, yes, the I that ICANN is a recognized institution for names and numbers, and we agree with the, the principles, the, the processes that are used, and we are going to ensure, along with the United States government, that it continues and is successful. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Laura, you get the last word. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. My name is Laura Dinardis. I'm an internet governance scholar and a professor at American University in Washington, DC. And I'm very happy to be part of this panel on the geopolitics of internet governance and appreciate the invitation. Thank you. I spent the last two years writing uh, my latest book on internet governance. It's going to be called <laughs> The Global War for Internet Governance, and it's coming out later this year by Yale University Press. What I tried to do is examine 
and describe the levers of internet governance that already exist. Sometimes while these kinds of dialogues go on, we forget that the process of internet governance is going on operationally in various institutions and through the private sector. I also tried to lay out um, some of the current debates and decisions that I believe will be setting the future of internet innovation and internet freedom in the years to come. So I'm delighted today to discuss, uh, I think I'll make three brief points this morning that will be a uh, follow on to some of the things that have already been intimated. The first point I would like to make is that internet governance conflicts are the new spaces in the 21st century where economic and political power is unfolding. And what I mean by that is that the debates sometimes are a proxy for other forms of political and economic conflicts. The debates are sometimes not actually about internet governance, but about other things that are going on in the world. So this is a very highly technical area. But it's one that is politically potent because it inherently involves the technical mediation of the public sphere, and in many cases, the privatization of conditions of civil liberties. Technologies of internet governance intersect and mediate conflicting values, such as freedom of expression and issues such as public safety. Think about uh, Google's decision and deliberations. Uh, they decided not to acquiesce to requests from 17 governments to take down the Innocence of Muslims video in the wake of um, a, a violent protests and rioting. Internet governance is entangled with national security in many ways, uh, far too many to itemize here, but you, you can think about Stuxnet, and um, you know, which probably does exemplify this kind of entanglement and the technically concealed and mediated nature of uh, what we could term modern warfare. Internet governance technologies are also now viewed as a very efficacious way to conduct intellectual property rights enforcement. If you think about how traditional intellectual property rights enforcement is uh, not really that effective, if you go after content or uh, sue individuals, it's done very little to stop piracy. So not surprisingly, interest has turned to various mechanisms of infrastructure and internet governance. So there's a turn to the domain name system, for example, for IP enforcement. There's a turn to graduated response and infrastructural approaches that cut off infrastructure and uh, many other um, mechanisms, uh, even blocking transactional and financial flows. Why is this? So corporate Media content providers have in some ways lost some control over the monetization of their own content. It's similar to how governments around the world have experienced a loss of control over content, and uh, in, in particular regimes with restrictive information policies to contain things like media accounts have lost this control. So they are moving into infrastructure and into technologies of internet governance. So this is a proxy, Cer certainly the Egyptian internet outage exemplifies this in the most clear way. So despite the physical geography of the internet and the diversity, you know, it's, it's, it's decentralized in terms of physical geography. There's a diversity of institutions, there's the acronym SOUP that Bill mentioned of institutions that oversee this infrastructure. There are centralized points of control. This is just a reality. Some are virtual, some are physical, some are virtually centralized and physically distributed, but all are increasingly recognized as points of control over internet infrastructure and therefore over content. The second point I'd like to make is one about the privatization of internet governance. Sometimes in a discussion, there is an overemphasis of the role of governments or intergovernmental organizations. But internet governance is not about governments. It's about governance. I'll say governance again. Governance is uh, traditionally thought of as the efforts of sovereign nation states to regulate behavior and activities within national borders or across national boundaries. And certainly governments have um, a, a very large and critical internet governance function, whether you're talking about antitrust, computer fraud and abuse, identity theft, uh, protection of children, uh, enacting privacy laws, there are many, many roles for governments. But most internet governance functions, this is a point I would like to emphasize, have not been the domain of governments, but of uh, private ordering. 
the design of technical architecture, standard setting activities, the roles of uh, new institutional forms, all enacted in historically specific contexts of uh, technological and social change. Private companies like VeriSign, for example, that um, serve as domain name registries, running very vital internet governance operations. Private telecommunication companies that make up the majority of the internet's backbone and can join via private contractual arrangements at these um, IXPs and interconnection points that Jane has worked so hard on, that are very vital in the developing world in particular. We have not-for-profit corporations doing uh, critical internet resource work. We have, um, we have private companies carrying out policy in these various areas, and, uh, and it's, a, it's appropriate in many of these areas. But they also are actors responding to political, a political stage that is much broader than that. They receive, uh, there's delegated censorship and enforcement. These private corporations um, receive requests from governments to remove defamatory material, to take down links, to hand over information about subscribers. So delegated surveillance, delegated censorship, delegated copyright enforcement, and delegated law enforcement in general. For better or worse, this has shifted to private intermediaries who, who fund many of these activities, who carry these things out without any compensation, and have to figure out uh, you know, the many different statutory environments of different and different regulatory environments in different countries. So these companies do assume a challenging task of arbitrating government requests. They also set policy in and of themselves in areas like privacy, reputation, freedom of expression, and other areas that are related to civil liberties. So the bottom line is that much internet governance originates in the private sector in private ordering or is delegated through private ordering from governments. And then a final point I'd like to make is that internet governance and this is a very important point, is not one system. I often get asked the question, should the United Nations control internet governance versus the United States or versus ICANN or versus uh, some other entity? Now that question in its first instance makes no sense whatsoever because there is such a mosaic of in internet governance, that, whether cybersecurity, interconnection, standard setting, critical internet resource management, it's distributed. So the internet is governed, but this is a complex mosaic of uh, coordination that is uh, beyond the bounds of these kinds of questions in the various entities that have already been um, addressed here. And that does include international treaties, it includes the laws of traditional governments within national boundaries, but it's far, far beyond that into the realm of technical design, into the realm of the policy role of private intermediaries and these other many institutions in the acronym soup that's been mentioned. So a constantly shifting balance of powers between private industry, international technical governance institutions, governments, and also civil society has been necessary to create the rough conditions for online economic and expressive liberty and has kept the internet operational for many years. This balance of powers is called multi-stakeholderism in the internet governance landscape. So a point that I'd like to leave with you is to not think about multi-stakeholderism as a value in and of itself. Why is that? It can't be applied homogeneously in a monolithic way to the set of keys that controls the internet. It, it just doesn't make sense to say that. The question is what type of oversight is necessary in any particular context in order to achieve and promote economic and expressive liberty. In some cases, private agreements among corporations have produced the most open results. In other cases, there's an expectation that governments have been responsible, and but in some other areas, like critical internet resources, there has been um, a great movement towards multi-stakeholder bodies with the input of civil society, private industry, and governments. So the same type of governance is not appropriate in every area, but if you look at internet governance as a whole, grassroots rather than top-down multi-stakeholderism has worked and has helped promote internet freedom. I, I become very concerned when I hear about top-down discussions of how do we impose multi-stakeholderism, because that's exactly not how the internet has been successful in the past. Um, so this, um, this interest in top-down regulation and imposition of multi-stakeholderism, it really is a significant shift 
against the historical norms of multi-stakeholder governance that have been around really since the late 1960s. Internet governance is not fixed any more than internet architecture is fixed. It's constantly evolving, it's constantly in a state of flux, and it's not a stretch to say that as goes internet governance, so goes internet freedom. These are very important issues that are being discussed here today, and it's very vital that the public and policymakers be engaged in these debates. So I'm very glad that we're discussing this today, and I appreciate the opportunity to be part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I think David and I get the privilege of the first question, then we'll throw it out. Um, I'm going to ask a question that um, looks at something that everybody kind of brought up and kind of mentioned, but governments want more control, right? So we're, this title of this is geopolitics. Governments want a bigger role and they want more control. And governments remain the most powerful international actors. To quote one of our friends, how many battalions has Walmart, right? And the answer is they don't have any, right? I've had this discussion with a lot of IT companies who will say, we have the same capabilities as governments. Really, you have nuclear submarines? That's so cool. Um, you know? Um, so you have the most powerful actors in a system who are unhappy with it, and the GTLD debate is a good example. How are you going to accommodate this political desire by many states, shared by many states, probably a majority of states? Where does the UN fit in on this? And then to Laura's points, you know, how do we distinguish roles where it's appropriate for government to have a bigger, a bigger responsibility or bigger sphere of action? How do we keep those the way that should stay out? So that's the thing I see when I talk to other governments is they, don't, they want a bigger role and they intend to get it. So what are you going to do? What, want to go down there? Do you want to start with Vanny and then? Thank you. I, uh, I think the, I mean, it's fascinating. Well, on the question about the nuclear submarine, though, this 14-year-old kid sitting somewhere in the middle of nowhere with his laptop is, and he's laughing at this question and he's thinking, oh, okay, let's see how fast this submarine is going to sink. <laughs> But uh, uh, I'll take a bet with you on that, Benny. <laughs> I'll take a bet with you. I, I don't, because I care about the people on the submarine. But um, but um, I I think uh, the question is that the the governments actually are the ones who initiated um, what uh, Jane mentioned about the plenty potential in Minneapolis when they started debating the internet and the WSAS, the World Summit on Information Society. And I'm sorry, we use abbreviations if. In case you don't know any of those, you can just ask us afterwards. There are so many. Uh, so the governments initiated this, but uh, and we mentioned the ITU a couple of times here, but the ITU actually turned down an offer to run the Internet back in 95. They said, oh, the Internet has no future. We don't care about this. We want to do radio and frequency and satellite management and stuff like that. So I think once the governments let the process run and the WCS... I'm even I'm forgetting. WISIS, the WISIS, <laughs> the World Summit on Information Society. We'll it, put a glossary it, online. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it allowed, and this was the first time ever that I uh, know of, it allowed actually civil society to participate in the discussions about uh, all these related to the internet questions. Now, we have to remember all these documents that were produced, the Tunis Agenda, the Geneva a declaration. They were actually written by governments, but the civil society, and I was on the governmental delegation back then, but as chair of ISOC Bulgaria, we did have uh, something to say in this debate. So once the genie is out of the bottle, so to speak, it's going to be, it's now very difficult to say, but we, the governments, have to have more control than you, whoever you are. Uh, so I think it's important that we understand, yes, the governments have a stake to play, but also have the other stakeholders, and that's why it's multi-stakeholders. I'm persuaded, but we'll go down the panel. Uh, I'll just quickly say, with respect to government control, in what context and where? Um, it depends on the debate. Again, the minister from Colombia, perfectly happy to allow the internet technical community, companies, public-private partnerships to flourish. He has other preoccupations for his country. Um, and that's in the broader country political, geopolitical, social, economic perspective as well. When he came to Geneva last week, he was highly complimentary of the work that the Internet Society had done. 
Um, there's a robust chapter, you know, chapters, many of our chapters around um, South America and Central America. You know, w why is it that certain government officials are embracing the Internet Society and ICANN and the regional Internet registries? I think for many of them they realize this is something we don't need to control. But why is it perhaps at another forum, if they're at the UNGA, and this would be a, an interesting question for Ambassador Revere, why does that shift so quickly? And I think it's, it's often, are you in a room with your colleagues at a table sitting behind them or in front of them and you're not really engaging across a, in a debate like we are, but you're having to speak for your country and your country as, as a different being or thing or entity, how is it that you position that, your country? So last week in Geneva at the WTPF, we had Brazil saying, why isn't it that other governments can't come to the table and talk about this issue? And one thing I would say is that um, a way that the Internet Society is trying to equalize the debate is through our chapters, through the work of our regional bureaus, through people like me when I go into a country. We, we've got to speak and talk to governments so that they don't think that what we're doing is something mysterious and, and bad that they need to control. And so it's broadening that debate, and sometimes it's broadening the debate outside the Ministry of Communications and the regulator. It, the Ministry of Economy cares about the economy, right? The Ministry of Finance in some countries wants a role, wants trade to flourish. Are we letting equipment in? Are we letting the infrastructure develop? So when we say government control, how do we shift the balance where we are in a forum where it is only a government body, the ITU, where the ITU is trying to let in other stakeholders as appropriate to their mandate and their treaties, as Laura has indicated. Um, but at an IT, uh, Internet Society meeting, we invite all stakeholders and welcome the different perspectives. But no one's trying to take specific control but to, to grow that infrastructure. Um, so just to, to add to the debate there. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I'm well aware that, as, as you point out, right, anytime I talk to, um, to government representatives, they, they want more control. Um, what's interesting is, I'll make a couple of points up front, but control is antithetical to the uh, permissionless inno innovation that is the hallmark of the Internet, and without it, the Internet will, will in fact collapse on itself, I believe, because we, we will stop seeing new things and we will be left with whatever services we currently have, and this is going to look an awful lot like the telephone system of old, where we had exactly one service, mm -hmm. and that was voice. So the innovation is, is essential to continue, so the illusion of control uh, or desire to control, in fact, will cause the collapse of the Internet. So I, I just I throw that out there. Um, second point is, in reality, no one controls the Internet. Um, if you take any piece of the Internet out, somebody else is going to step in either and replace that or it will, it will heal itself and work around the problem area. We have seen that as well. We've had brownouts mm -hmm. on the Internet, but we have never really had a full blackout where the Internet goes down in large measure. Um, so I, I think that control sort of in the large, you know, where the government said we want to control the Internet, well, that's never going to happen. It just, it can't. Now, we may not be able to make the case to them that that can never happen, but I, I think that is a fact. <clears throat> However, what we could look for is control in the small, right? Areas where, and I think to Laura's point, where it's more appropriate for governments to have a larger role, let's say, than other stakeholders. Let's find those areas and you know, bring them in, allow them to do what they, what they do best as governments, um, and, you know, and get on with it, give them the perception of control, at least. And again, perception is reality. And I think, you know, we can find examples. I threw the AOC out as an example, a small example, but it may have some value where governments can say, we actually sat down with, with ICANN, we talked to them, we negotiated, we better understand. We're willing to make promises, they're willing to make promises. Um, that, that gives us a seat at the table but a little more than we have at the GAC. So I think that and perhaps other things, let's find some. We're talking about global internet governance. And the truth is that a lot of governments don't have an excellent track record in this area. They have repressive information policies that restrict the flow of information and enact surveillance on citizens and, and, and stop access to knowledge rather than promoting it. 
So the same exact technologies that can increase freedom of expression and economic expression can also be used to restrict the flow. So it's just important to say that that more governance is not with governments is not necessarily good. Second point is that governments are accountable to citizens. So if you look at internet governance processes in general, where do you find the legitimacy? It, if, if distributed governance is happening across private ordering and across institutions, the question is where does that legitimacy come from? And it comes from a number of different places, but one is transparency, one is accountability, and one is participation. So you look at an organization such as the Internet Engineering Task Force, and they have openness in participation and that all voices can be heard. There are a lot of barriers such as technical expertise, money, all those kinds of things, but voices can be heard. It's open in its development of the standards. It's open in its implementation in that the standards are actually published and another company can take the ball and run with it, citizens can read it, there's accountability and its openness in its use in that multiple competing products can come. So this is just an example of how there are many different ways to find the kinds of legitimacy to have this multi-stakeholder governments without government interaction necessarily. And um, I'll just leave it at that. I have a, a few other points I'll make later. Well, I guess I've already uh, indicated I don't think that um, uh, we're going to see any, any great uh, uh, derogation of uh, sovereignty anytime soon that uh, governments will continue to be the major players in these in these areas um, so it seems to me the, the the most important questions come down to this it's it is the question of whether or not there are going to be agreements with respect to intergovernmental activities that will indicate that will be controlling or will some ways uh, deflect or affect the internet and you can find things that governments only governments can do that they're going to need to do. They're going to need to con either continue to do or do in the first instance that will have very large effects on the Internet. The first one is to try to figure out some set of arrangements that will improve the cybersecurity environment. Um, this can only be done by governments. Um, it is something that is absolutely imperative, and uh, if it's, uh, uh, and frankly, if we don't make some progress on it soon, it will be, uh, 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 very unfortunate from the standpoint not just of the internet but everybody on the face of the earth. Um, secondly, there are things like trade, international trade, international agreements of all kinds that affect the internet and, and here we have to acknowledge that when we say internet we're not really talking only about the technical architectures and all the rest. We're talking now about essentially everything that, uh, uh, that traverses um, the, uh, the transmission systems. So there are trade-related things that governments can do. The attention of government should be directed that way. Um, the same thing can be said with respect to crime, criminal activity. Uh, we have um, uh, formally and informally uh, arrangements that, uh, that permit um, law enforcement organizations to work with one another. These need to be improved. There are things of that nature that we can do. But we then get to I, th I think things that are less precise but are very important. And, and they are the, uh, essentially the, the view of countries that given the importance of the Internet and given their own importance, their own emerging importance, that they deserve a place at the high table uh, and that uh, part, of, part of the desire to get there um, may well involve uh, essentially uh, uh, imposing costs on the Internet and its efficiencies and the rest uh, just for the sake of uh, being sure that they've secured that place. And here um, I can say there's a phenomenology that um, uh, I, I'm certain exists and that we need, to be, we need to be somewhat conscious of. It really depends on who is in the room with respect to, the, to, to governments. Um, uh, to, to engage in a very crude generalization, the foreign ministry of most countries is going to be very concerned with the stature of the country with respect to status, with respect to things of that nature, whereas the technical ministries, the Ministry of Communications, Telecommunications, and so forth, may be much more alert to questions of um, uh, the efficiency of the transmission systems, uh, development, things of that nature. Um, so that you have these internal differences, these internal uh, struggles, and while I'm, while I'm on the subject, uh, uh, you may take this as a little bit of an advertisement. I've just finished reading a new book. Uh, 
that I think is absolutely brilliant on this point. It's a book called The Sleepwalkers. It is about the how Europe ended up going to World War I. Not the why, not who was, who was at fault, but the how of it. And um, over hundreds and hundreds of pages, the author makes an excellent um, point of the fact that the, the internal rivalries, the uncertainties, the confusions within individual governments um, contributed enormously uh, to, to this kind of a phenomenology. Now, what that, what that suggests in this particular context, to me anyway, is, again, that we have to keep, we the United States, we anybody who is interested in um, uh, the continued uh, progress of the Internet, have to be as fully engaged as we can be uh, with uh, our co government counterparts around the world. I, my friend Chris Painter, who handles the cyber-related matters at the State Department, is very uh, uh, focused on trying to suggest to other governments that what we need is a whole-of-government dialogue. In other words, he, Chris believes we want to get everybody from our counterpart government in the room, and we want to have all of our relevant players in the United States in the room when we talk about these matters. Uh, and I think um, as a kind of practical suggestion, this seems to me to be something to be very, very useful to try to pursue. We already have a couple questions. We'll, I see we have four. We'll go down. Could I ask people to stand up, introduce themselves, and then ask your question? So we'll do one, two, three, four. Go ahead. And five. OK. Can you hear me? Um, my name is Andrew Mack. And I am with AM Global, and I am uh, I am I'm mindful of how complex this task is. I'm the I'm, I'm I've been to 17 ICANN meetings, four or five IGF meetings, and I'm still learning the language. So if it gives you any kind of sense of how complex it is, and English is my first language, and almost everything happens in English, and it's still pretty baffling. What I'd like to ask the panel to do is to complete two sentences or complete two thoughts that you've both that you've touched on already. The first one is, is that uh, we do a lot of work in emerging markets, and a big part of the problem when we're talking to emerging markets governments is that they say, well, we're not entirely comfortable with the system as it is, but at least the IT was talking about our issues. Bill, you mentioned, uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned spam, and we've talked with other people who talk about infrastructure. They talk about some of these issues. Nature abhors a vacuum in the absence of the rest of the system talking about what are perceived as being emerging markets issues. I think we, those of us who believe that the system is, as it is makes sense risk something by not addressing that. How can we address that more effectively? And the second question is, you, you've all kind of uh, danced around the outside of the, the big tidal wave that's coming with the new GTLDs. That's going to have a major effect on the world internet community. That's going to have a major effect on the way that governments and uh, uh, governments are at least perceived that their citizens are going to be asking about that. So what, if anything, do you think uh, uh, we should be prepared for in that? <laughs> to my earlier point, right? Uh, it's it's generic top-level domain. So .com, .net, uh, .org. These are GTLDs. So fair to say that no one knows this is coming. I'm going to jump in on spam, which is not. I want to, for the record, indicate that this is not um, something that we normally are involved in with the Internet Society itself. Obviously, the Internet Engineering Task Force, where the organizational home of the IETF, deals with many issues related to cybersecurity-esque issues. But within the Internet Society, we do often get questions about cybersecurity. As Bill has indicated, the wicket revealed there were many issues that governments were interested in talking about. Spam was one of them. To answer your question, one of the ways we can engage in the absence of X, we can engage. We are setting up workshops through the Internet Society to go to countries. We're, s we're focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, to engage and debate about spam. What is it? So that we demystify what spam is. Some thought that U.S. companies were uh, sending spam on purpose for financial reasons so they could recoup more money. Well, there are a lot of other things that happen with spam as well. There could be botnets, malicious code, other. But the, the question is, why wouldn't we engage in the absence of of the lack of engagement, we must engage. And I think across the board, and to Ambassador Revere's point, at a level that's appropriate, government to government, stakeholders to stakeholders, we're going in and working with our colleagues in the Bureau in Africa that we have, who are rock stars, from my opinion, and 
asking them who do we talk to in government where are we you know who do we target in the internet community and how do we engage and broaden that dialogue so that it's a more mature debate but it's also not something that we we say no you can't talk about it because if you say to, to governments and others perhaps at the wicket, no, you can't talk about it, they're going to say, well, we want to talk about it just because. So they, they think there's something there. And by not engaging, we're actually making it more difficult for ourselves to, to actually get, get on with the work, to build infrastructure. And this is one key thing. And I want to focus on this for a second, and I'll stop talking in a minute. We've seen at the Internet Society three pillars that have led to development over the last 21 years plus. Human, technical, and governance infrastructures being developed in the bottom up uh, manner that um, Laura was talking about. The internet has thrived through this engagement, through permissionless innovation, as Bill has said. How do we encourage that to still happen, engage in the debate, so we don't have a, a, f a standoff, a checkmate? Because we don't want a checkmate right now. That won't do anything to encourage the debate, engage with others, and facilitate the development of the infrastructure, which is so critical. Thank you. Uh, Bill, Laura, are you going to add something? I you don't have to. Yeah, okay, well, then we'll just do, we'll do Bill. Okay. Bill, I'll go first. Thanks, I'll be really quick. Anytime you discuss spam, you're discussing content. That is an issue. And so, you know, what we have seen in, um, in a number of international discussions is that sometimes when there's a discussion of spam, is that a proxy for some other kind of content regulation? And when you, look, when you think about how you actually um, enforce something like spam in a centralized way as opposed to at the edges of the network, such as in an email platform, you have to do deep packet inspection and inspect the content. So I just wanted to raise a caveat and ask the question, is that something that we want for the inspection of packets across the internet to be to be looked at for spam? So I just wanted to raise the caveat. On the, on the generic top level domain expansion, for those of, of you who are not familiar with this, ICANN just authorized the development of uh, many, many more generic top level domains. The proposals have been very interesting. There have been some debates about which ones should be allowed or not. But I think that there's no technical reason to do this, but it's, um, it will serve a purpose of providing more spaces for innovation and branding and marketing. The bad side of that is that it creates much more of a trademark uh, problem for trademark holders. So there are some good points to that and some bad. I mean, can I just interrupt on that one? Because this is a crucial point in some ways. And I'm going to tell you something I heard from a Southeast Asian uh, minister who said, hey, these uh, GTLDs, you know who made that decision? We weren't involved. It wasn't a governmental decision. How, who is it that is, here's something that affects my economy, my security, and my citizens, and I had no role. I don't like that. What do you say back to him? And the answer I, I, should not be, you know, the wonderfulness of it all. <laughs> no, but since I'm the only one from ICANN, I guess I have to respond to that one, even though I made a disclaimer in the beginning. <laughs> and uh, I think the, the answer is that actually the new, and for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the new generic top-level domains, it's at the, at the moment, you basically have everything that you know after the dot, dot .com, dot .info, dot .biz, or dot .country code. The new generic top-level domain program will introduce thousands of new uh, top-level domains. So there will be, for example, dot .nyc for New York City, or dot .berlin for Berlin, dot .moscow in two languages for the city of Moscow. So the reality is, uh, Jim, is to answer to your question, is that uh, the governments did participate in this program. They, they did it through a governmental body, which is part of ICANN. It's called the Governmental Advisory Committee. And even though it's called Advisory Committee, and some people say, but I don't want to give an advice, I want to have a veto power or something, mm -hmm. the Governmental Advisory Committee actually has a pretty uh, big influence upon the decisions that the ICANN board takes. And what happens is that um, it's in this new world of the Internet, there are always new things happening, and we need to adjust the same way we adjust to the fact that when a governmental, as an internet operator, which I used to be back in Bulgaria, when, when uh, the police comes and says, we want to know this IP address, who it belongs to, we say, do you have a court order? And they say yes, and we have to give it, because it's part of what you do outside of the internet world. So the same way, I think government also adjusts to the fact that, yes, the internet was developed as something different than what we know. And to, the, to that point, I mean, uh, there is a, this cliche which says the internet was created so that it will sustain a nuclear attack. If it was created for that reason, which I know it wasn't, but anyway, if it was, 
then it will survive any attack that it, uh, it can, uh, anyone can think of, whether that's a government or a 14-year-old kid sitting in the middle of nowhere. Let me do two things here. Uh, first, uh, if the online audience wants to submit questions, they can do it through the Twitter hashtag. So we'll, we'll get them if you send them in. Which hashtag are we using? The hashtag is geowebgov. Yeah, so we're looking forward to those. Um, second, um, in the interest of time, maybe we could compress both uh, questions and answers a little bit. And I think we had one question here, and then Dave, you had a question, and then we had two more in the back. So. OK, sure. Hi, good morning. My name is Carolina Rossini. I am a lawyer and law professor from Brazil. So I want to thank Janie for the very kind words. I worked on this for 12 years, and now I am the project director for the Latin America Resource Center at New America Foundation. Uh, we think the Internet Governance and Human Rights is a very long name. <laughs> um, so my question is, and I think Jane tackled this a little bit, uh, is how we uh, build capacity within this new generation that's coming out, right? You, you tackle a little bit the generation that's already in the debate that still has questions, right? But we have a huge new generation coming, and we need to build some type of curricula to address those issues and to address those needs and to create capacity also in developing and emerging countries uh, to deal with that. So my question for you is how, and I like a lot what Laura said about the grassroots mood stakeholderism, and so how we can, with that ethos in mind, create some partnerships and create, because like we cannot go to every country doing workshops, right? Like I'm, I'm exhausted of traveling and you probably are too. So how we do that uh, using technology to uh, uh, reach out to this new uh, generation. Uh, and also how to address, for example, this new generation to understand the complexity because as David mentioned, we have internet governance issues being discussed in TPP, in ACTA, in all those ones, and not everybody's paying attention to that. So how to address that complexity? Thank you. Sure. Um, so uh, partly glib but partly truthful <laughs> answer is we have this thing called the internet. Um, so if we... <laughs> Uh, produce material in, in, a, um, in an acceptable form. It can be delivered through web browsers. Uh, we can do webcasting. Um, it is a problem, as you point out, to get to every country on the planet. There are roughly 200 of them. Um, and you know, to do capacity building on that scale is difficult. I would point out the ITU has that ability, but it has chosen, in my opinion, to not educate, not uh, <coughs> Know, do the, the work that it claims it is supposed to do with respect to the internet in terms of educating people. So we ended up at the wicket with spam as a problem. That's also a shame on us mm -hmm. because we didn't recognize that as a problem. Um, but we did sit down with people and listen to them and we know now we have to go out and do the hard work. Um, but I, I would really strongly suggest that we begin looking at ways to educate people remotely. Um, that also plays into sort of development goals. The, the UN is doing some things at myworld.org. And the top three things, no matter what region you look at, country you look at, are education, healthcare, and a, a open government. Um, and the internet can help with all of those. So I think we should, you know, we should be focusing on those things, is how to bring more people in um, remotely when we can and, and, and educate them about things like the IETF, ICANN, et cetera. Yeah, uh, my co-moderator has a question. Thanks, Bill. Although, Bill, you're so mean to the ITU, you're making me look good. I mean, it's really good. David, please. Yeah, to follow up on that, a lot of people in the ISOC community view the ITU and the wicket very, very adversarially, <laughs> um, to put it mildly. And Jane, you spoke well about the need to be more involved. And Bill, you, you spoke, you, you said some interesting things about transferring some of the protocol DNS IP functions that the ITU is trying to tackle to ICANN and getting governments more involved in ICANN. How realistic is it to get greater government buy-in and participation and, and for ICANN to become that forum instead of the ITU? One quick thing, um, partnerships are key. And that was one thing the Internet Society is actually working now on something we're calling a learning management system, a platform where we can hopefully be an aggregator and not try and be the one and only, be very clear about that, <laughs> but bring in information for training purposes. 
We do this through chapters as well on the ground, um, 94 of them through our bureaus. But we can't, and it's not just, uh, obviously, the Internet Society. ICANN is doing amazing work. They've expanded their reach. They're putting in new offices around the world. I think it's through partnerships, and I can also articulate factually, we're working closely with the World Bank now. They've got programs around the world, Internet Exchange Point, infrastructure development. It has to be a conversation that's broadened, working with governments as well, but and with the ITU. Let's be clear, there were challenges, and the wicket was a, was tricky, um, to use a colloquial word. But um, recently I was asked to provide a presentation, and my colleague Sally, who's uh, watching from home, who is supposed to be here versus me, will find this uh, a bit of a surprise, because I was just asked yesterday to participate in an ITU development sector meeting. We can broaden the, ba the debate that way. You know, one of the people always talk about electronic Pearl Harbors, and I usually call the wicket the, a digital Dunkirk, because <laughs> we, we, we didn't win, but we were able to escape. Can you hold up your hands if you have questions uh, out there? Jim? That, oh, goodness. Yeah, well, while we're, getting, uh, while we're getting microphones up. Okay, I wanted to respond okay. to David's yeah. question. I think the key issue here is actually leadership. And we have seen in the last few months, uh, a, I mean, inevitably, when people talk about internet governance, they talk either about the IT or ICANN. For some reasons, they kind of avoid all the other structures, which uh, I'm sorry, Jane, you know, and me also being with ISOC. Uh, but people talk about ICANN and the IT in like 99% of the time. And I think the leadership uh, has shown of the two organizations in the last probably six months, actually starting from the wicket, I think no matter how we call wicket, and who won, who lost, I think. I hate the idea about uh, comparing this to winning and losing. What we saw at the wicket when the first time uh, the, the CEO of ICANN spoke, and then at the WTPF he spoke, we saw there was an amazing picture, and you can Google it and uh, find it on Flickr, where the Secretary General of the ITU, Hamadun Touré, put a blue helmet <laughs> at the opening of the WTPF and said, well, people say that we want to take over the internet. I'm here to tell you we are not going to take over the internet. And I think that's a, a little change. Now, we have to be aware that next year there is a plenipotentiary meeting at the ITU and there will be a new Secretary General elected. And I think uh, this, the biggest challenge that we are facing as community, as internet geeks or internet users, is that there are always opportunities to improve or not. And if, if whoever is running on this uh, could run on a platform that the ITU is doing a great job and should do a better job in capacity building, radio, whatever, or they can run on the wicked platform, so to speak, and say, well, the ITU is not doing enough in the internet, so we need to do more. And clearly that will bring a lot of heated debates. And I'm sure that uh, this will, I mean, we'll see it in the next 18 months if every, everyone here is uh, healthy and alive. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by the thought that a uh, couple of people just sitting together and talking to each other can say, you know what, Let's, I'm inviting you to speak at this conference. And, I'll come and speak at yours, so you know, whatever. Okay, Mike. And then we've got, we've got some in the back, if we could get in. Oh, microphone, so you're next then, but Mike, go ahead. I'm Mike Nelson with Bloomberg Government, and I'm also very involved in the local chapter of the Internet Society. A uh, couple of real quick points. Um, I want to start right now the campaign to get Bill Smith elected head of the ITU and Jane Kaufman deputy director. Uh, second, uh, I want to point out something very important that uh, ISOC's doing tomorrow. For those of you who are members, we have a conference call on the results of the forum that you've all been mentioning, and uh, that's available to all members. Um, there's also a great paper by, B Bill, by David Clark that everyone should read called Control Point Analysis. If you wanted to understand all the acronyms and how this all works, it's a very clear academic paper that David Clark wrote for TPRC. But I, have a, but I have a question, real quickly. Here in Washington, we say all politi politics is local. I actually don't believe that. I think, actually, the economics is as important. And only one of you really talked about money. Laura talked about the flow of money. And none of you talked about the flow of dirty money. A lot of what's driving these countries to do what they're doing is because there are corrupt politicians who are skimming off large quantities of money off their telecom operations. And when we come in and tell them to open up their markets and let American companies make money, they see that as a threat to the money they're getting and putting in their Swiss bank accounts. Is there anything we can do to change the role of corruption in this whole debate? 
Don't all leap forward. <laughs>
um, into IP enforcement. So rather than doing that, which can tamper with the stability and security of the internet, I think that approaches that are uh, that are more targeted, even if it gets into access, infrastructure, transactions, and payments, that that has less of a collateral damage to the overall technologies of internet governance than using the domain name system. Thank you. The question I wrote down was uh, IP protection, so we might just want to note that there's a trade and law enforcement aspect to that as well. So I don't know who, Phil, Vanny, did you want to do the negotiation? Or? Well, I mean, they asked me, but I think Phil, 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 yeah. Phil can uh, respond more diplomatically than me, let's put it this way. <laughs> well, let, me, uh, let me see if I can't combine some, say something about the two questions combined. Um, it does seem to me that um, we, we have an opportunity at the moment uh, that may be, uh, may be an unusual one with respect to uh, efforts to negotiate new trade arrangements, both in the context of the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, trade discussions been going on for some time, and now the new uh, so-called TTIP, uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment uh, uh, Partnership, uh, that would be a in essence, a, an EU or European-US uh, uh, free trade agreement. Um, this, I, I think these trade agreement negotiations may be the thing that gives us the best opportunity we've had in a long time to make some progress in terms of uh, international agreements, um, um, understandings, mutual understandings about how to uh, proceed with respect to a whole range of subjects that are very important to the Internet. The question of intellectual property protection, question of uh, 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 transnational flow of data, uh, privacy, a whole range of things like that. And I think if we're talking about, particularly talking about formal international negotiations, these may be the two most promising things uh, that we have on the agenda right now. I feel like I'm missing something. Hello, my name is Paulette Lee. I'm an international development communications, as in marketing, not as in IT person, and therefore have understood only about a third of what you've said because of all the acronyms. <laughs> so I would, first of all, like to suggest that on the program you might want to print the acronyms that are frequently used. Um, my question is, I'm concerned that I'm not hearing some perspectives vis-a-vis -vis geopolitics. I'm not hearing the perspective of, it was mentioned a little bit, uh, but I'm not hearing the perspective of an autocrat. You know, let's say somebody, uh, a leader in Iran. And I'm not hearing the perspective of somebody of a future. I'm not hearing the perspective of someone who doesn't have, uh, someone who is, let's say, the 14-year-old. I'm not hearing the perspective of the person who doesn't have access readily to electricity in Sub-Saharan Africa, where I've worked extensively. I'm hearing a Western, white perspective, and I'm wondering if you could put some other hats on and speak to a different perspective. Thank you. So the Ayatollah Markowski will, uh, <laughs> address. Well, I've lived 21, in, 21 years under communism, so I guess I'm the only one that can, right. on the panel that yeah. is considered non-West. But um, I, I actually have made it, it's on my, on my notes here, that I should have, somebody, I think Laura mentioned something about freedom of expression, and that reminded me of uh, the fact that, uh, if you don't know, the communist constitutions were the most democratic in the world. And we had freedom of expression, and as the Polish say, yes, we did, but there was no freedom after using this freedom of expression. <laughs> so, so I completely understand you when you, when you say that. However, what I noticed was uh, that in the context of internet governance, uh, not always the ideas that we think are the right ones come necessarily from the West, so to speak. There are many ways when ideas come from non-Western countries. And this division, West, East, South, North, I find it uh, not quite true in the internet governance context. If you go and talk to, if you go and participate in one of the, say, Internet Governance Forums, the IGS, you will see there are like a couple of thousand people from around the globe, mm -hmm. 
and they talk about, they exchange ideas, and I think that's the beauty of the, the debate that we are talking about, not necessarily governmentally driven. Because uh, as we mentioned, uh, when you have the foreign ministry, it's one thing. When you have the telecom ministry, it's a different thing. Well, guess what happens when you have people from Brazil who are coming and talking about um, copyright, but not about the copyright we know, but about the Creative Commons, which was created by an American, by the way. But it's now around the globe. And Sweden is the country that has the most licenses, wor licensed work, uh, works under Creative Commons. Is this, is this is this beautiful? It is. Is, this, is it good to share information or is it good to control it? Now, if you talk to an American company, though, you will say, no, 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 copyright, creative commons is bad. We need to have, you know, like the MPAA and the RIAA. They will be, they will be all over you. And this is a debate which I think should not be framed in the context of naming somebody authoritarian or not. And uh, to use the opportunity, because people often think about Russia being authoritative and you know Putin trying to control. There is this famous dialogue now. It, now it's famous. Uh, two years ago, Mr. Putin, then as a prime minister, visited the ITU and had a conversation with the Secretary General. And they talked about uh, a number of items. Now, what was not known is that every, the first five minutes of every meeting of the prime minister or the president of Russia, putting, uh, they take minutes and they put a stenogram out of, on the website. So to, to the astonishment of many, uh, the discussion about the control over the internet was driven not by Mr. Putin, but by the Secretary General. And nobody knows it. If you read the Western media, you'll see Putin wants control. It's, it wasn't the case. So I'm always very cautious when we talk about it, and I always want to hear what the people at the IGF and other forums want to say. J Jane and Bill, did you have quick follow-ons? Oh, super quick. Um, with respect to the Internet Governance Forum, the IGF, key place for discussion, there is a youth forum there. There is often very robust debate. I can, I'm going to try and channel some people that I met with in Johannesburg last year, um, about 21 Internet Exchange Point coordinators, network operators, and managers. Uh, again, well, we may be here in Washington, and that's why you see the people that you see up here. Um, we have many people around the world that we work with very closely. If I were to channel some of those peering coordinators, they'd say internet governance. I'm trying to interconnect the network. I'm trying to channel local traffic around the country. Governance for them is how to maintain the lock on the door, the air conditioning unit, the electricity, as you're saying. For them, it's also do we, do we create a committee to run this IXP when we, when we mature? So uh, there are very nuanced levels of debate from the technical perspective, as Laura is saying, at the Internet Engineering Task Force, where people come together from all over the world in many ways to talk about the infrastructure. And so there are, it's very difficult to pinpoint, you know, exactly how I can articulate it for you, but there are people around the world who are having this debate, but they're having it at different layers. Yeah, technical, human, economic, political, as Ambassador Veers art articulated. And I'm not trying to represent all of their views, but we do know very well how, how things have uh, succeeded over the last 21 years from the human, the technical, and the internet governance uh, infrastructure development. But we can continue the debate with you offline about some of those aspects if you'd like. Do you want, maybe we should take the question, Bill. Is that okay, or do you want to I just want quickly on the, so I want to follow on Jane's point, right, the 14-year-olds. The um, uh, that absolutely they show up at the IGF. They talk to people like Vint Cerf, yeah. Bob Pepper. Okay, so they are engaged. You don't see them here because they aren't actually involved in the governance of the internet. And the reason you see a lot of you know, middle-aged or older white men is because yeah. we're, we're the ones, and there's some women, I know, yeah. I know. But we're, we're the ones actually that, you know, at least in Washington, you know, had a lot to do with the internet in the early days and, and there on. Also, so, CSIS is the home of old white men. I'm really surprised that everyone <laughs> yeah, would like to exactly. give, me, give me a break. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the last point on this I would want to make is that what we are doing in, in terms of the internet and internet governance is not just for our children. We have, to, we have to, an obligation to look beyond them and see what their children want to do with it. And for us, the, what we, we hear generally is, uh, I, I think, is a keep it free and open. We want to be able to do things with it. We don't know what, but we want to be able to do things with it. We had a question over there, yes. and then one on the internet, and then one in the front. Yes, hi, my name is Lee Marie Thompson. I'm a member of the ISOC uh, DC chapter. We have two questions from our Twitter feed, uh, GeoWebGov. Um, the first from Andrew Mack. 
Uh, Brazil as internet is an internet power in cybersecurity infrastructure. Will we see new cables uh, in Brazil, Brazil to Africa and what would change? And the that was a statement. Okay, all right. So that's not a question. And then, and then, <laughs> so we could touch base on that. And then the other. Um, uh, Le Marie, yes, we'll be taking questions from Twitter in a minute. We want to take a few more from okay. the audience. And I got them up here. You got but them. Thanks. Great. So yeah. We had. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my name is Joe Moss. I am a digital media internet freedom fellow at USAID. So my question is actually for Ambassador Revere. If we could take a sort of step back, a more macro look at how the United States government is structuring its approach to internet governance in terms of communicating across agencies to formulate policy and perspectives. How can, just to drill down a little, how can USAID engage at the mission level, for example, on issues of development as it relates to internet governance and furthering the United States position in this area? It's a very good question. I think um, sort of briefly there are, there are sort of two things maybe to be said about it. The uh, first is that um, uh, the normal interagency process um, uh, applies to almost all of the internet related uh, policy questions that we pursue, uh, uh, and um, uh, it is uh, it is something that, that um, uh, consumes an enormous amount of energy and activity as uh, uh, the discussions between them among all relevant agencies take place. They normally uh, take place, or at least uh, in some sense, under the auspices of the White House, but but um, also uh, a, a little less formally. Secondly, the the, the point you make particularly about um, uh, our missions and about the development activities is something that I think is enormously important. It is something that, um, uh, frankly, we work at, or we did at least uh, uh, during the time I was at the State Department, in a somewhat informal way. It is something that needs to be stepped up. Um, uh, we had uh, uh, regular liaison uh, discussions with USAID here in Washington. Um, but th these are discussions that have to involve, uh, ideally, many, many other uh, players, uh, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, others that are also participants in terms of, in terms of the uh, important development possibilities. And um, uh, it's an area where there's, there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. Thank you. I'm David McCauley with Bloomberg BNA. And I have a question uh, in the, about the name and address space that Iana and I can't take care of. It's an important discrete part of the Internet governance. And it has to do with the Governmental Advisory Committee, which seems to be morphing rather quickly. And so I'm asking if anyone would like to comment on how GAC is interacting with ICANN and how ICANN is going to respond to the GAC as, as the GAC seems to be exerting a little bit more influence and broader, broader power, and our government's waking up to what the GAC is and what their participation is in the GAC. Thank you. There is somebody who can respond actually more properly to that question. Hi, I'm, <coughs> I'm Jamie Hedlund. I'm with, uh, with ICANN uh, and have uh, dealt a lot uh, uh, with, with the board and the GAC on, on exactly these issues. And I think ICANN has actually, uh, there's a great story behind ICANN and the GAC's involvement. Uh, as far as I know, it's the only um, multi-stakeholder organization where there's an institutional role for governments uh, within, uh, within the organization. Uh, under the, there, the, the, there's a governmental advisory committee, it now has 124 member states, uh, or 20, 124 governments that, who are members, and about 25 uh, IGOs who are observers. Um, it has grown in leaps and bounds over the past few years. Um, it was highly effective um, and influential in shaping the new GTLD program. Um, it, before it was launched, there was a board GAC consultation. Um, the, board, the GAC had 12 topic areas divided into 80 issues, and the board and the GAC uh, uh, reached resolution on 90% of them. Most recently, coming out of the Beijing uh, meeting that we just had in April, 
uh, the GAC, as many of you may have seen, sent their uh, communique, uh, which has 11 pages of advice, uh, additional advice on um, uh, GTLD strings. Um, and that process is, is making its way through. So um, I think I think ICANN is a great example of governments, you know, working in their capacity and on uh, advising on matters of public policy, uh, having an effective uh, role uh, that's guaranteed by the bylaws, which requires the board to consider GAC advice. Um, so it, it's it it is a it is a model that can work that is not government only, but in which you know a lot of ICANN's credibility hinges on the uh, government's having an effective uh, voice uh, in, uh, within ICANN. Okay, why don't we take two questions from Twitter? Okay, we Thank have you, a Jamie. few questions, yeah. two short questions. At Laura Denardis, looking forward to your book, Can I Pre-Order? That's <laughs> <laughs> a yes or a no? I love that question. Um, <laughs> it's, um, I, think, I think you can pre-order it on Amazon now. So the answer is Coming Amazon. Out. Yes, Amazon.com. Okay. Right. Thank you. And will someone please let me know where I can find David Clark's paper? TPRC.org. TPRC.org. Okay. okay, moving on to another. I tweeted an answer to your question on Twitter. Oh, pardon me. Okay. Who do you think are the current, this relates to the question Mike asked earlier, who do you think are the current kings of the flow of money in the Internet, and how do you think it might change in the future? Whoever knows the answer can approach me after the session. So yeah. <laughs> okay, Cy Cyprus. We'll take one from the four, and then we're gonna. That'll be the last question. Did we have one? We had one in the middle back there. I'm Jose Pardo, a lawyer. Question for Laura. Oh, one minute. We need the mic. Oh. Jose Pardo, I'm an attorney. Uh, Laura, you touched on the subject of um, non-democratic governments and um, in. I'd like to know what your perspective is on youth, young people who are more attuned to the internet and their role with uh, states that rule propaganda and all control of what people know as the view of the world as it happened in the Soviet Union before it collapsed. One of the things I always feel when I talk to Chinese officials is some of them live in a pink bubble because they're reading people's daily. And so they don't know a lot of what we would know. And it makes it very difficult to have a discussion. Now, there are other officials in China who clearly know exactly what's going on. And you can have good discussions with them. But Laura, I don't know if the Thank you. That's a, a really important question. And I, I think that when you look at media narratives around the subject and discussions of Arab Spring and the possibilities of social media to enact change, what's forgotten in that whole narrative is the fact that there are real identification requirements in social media and ways to uh, an entire ecosystems of um, identity extraction in which governments can find out who people are. So it's, um, it's a constant cat and mouse game between uh, technologies of dissent and technologies of repression. And I think that a lot of the answers here are in, um, in technologies and uh, particularly ones that can provide some anonymization. Um, I don't really have a great answer to this uh, question except to say that it's an important one because um, the, the narrative about um, the prospects for democratic change through the internet do not capture the reality of these kinds of identity infrastructures and repression that do occur, and people are in jail right now because of this, uh, the exact issues that you're talking about. Um, why don't we go down the row and just any final thoughts from our panelists, because this is a pretty knowledgeable group here. Sure. Um, so I'll, the, my final thought is, is, is around the, the GTLD space uh, the new GTLDs and the GAC advice in particular. Um, I, I think we're at a, with ICANN, we're at a, an important moment, um, especially following on from the wicket, um, which was, um, I, I think, was a seminal moment for the Internet. Um, it, at that time, it, it became clear, um, 54 to 89, um, that you know, there are a set, a large set of, um, of uh, member states 
that want to see a free, open, and generative internet, and there are an, another set that would prefer something different. Um, and I think a large number of those may not know why they want something different, but that's where they are. Um, ICANN has an opportunity here with, with the GAC advice and the new GTLD space to actually pay attention to the GAC advice. Um, much of that advice, having read through it, may not be um, may, may not be considered favorable by many within the community. Um, but it is advice from governments, um, and it was very carefully considered. I know I've sp spoken with the people who have uh, who helped produce it. Um, I think the board um, the board will go against that advice, not so much at its own peril, but it, it, it will raise issues in the larger uh, debate on the geopolitics of internet governance. This is an important time. This whole process um, is, uh, is being inspected. You know, I, I've said in a meeting in Beijing, in the business constituency meeting um, back from the 70s, the whole world is watching, right? If you're, you remember that, that time period, the whole world is watching what ICANN is doing at this point. And the decisions that are made are, are going to have an impact going forward. Jane. How do we broaden the debate as the internet technical community with government effectively? It's an important uh, discussion that the internet community should have with it, among and with itself and with the, the broader global community. We work very hard to try and build internet infrastructure to promote the protocols that run that infrastructure. How do we educate and how do we have those conversations better? Because this isn't an us versus them. This is a collaborative discussion. We need to have that and think about better ways to do it. Thank you. Uh, Vanny. Thank you. So um, I, having, having sued the government of Bulgaria 12, 13 years ago, I, uh, and then, and that's, I, that's why he lives here. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> you, you shouldn't have said that because now you're ruining the moment. Everyone was thinking, oh, and he's alive. Um, I have to tell you two things which I learned back then. Because, again, the government said, we're going to license the internet service operators because we can. And yes, they could. And nobody, and I still remember people from the government telling us, but why don't you want to have a license? It's so nice. You're going to put it on the wall in your office, and your service will be much better. And we kind of we couldn't click what's the relation between having a license and providing fast and cheap internet. But one thing the then prime minister said, which I still remember, he said, guys, if you want to, by the way, he joined the Internet Society later and became a member uh, together with the president. So he said, if you have a problem and you want the government to solve your problem, you have to make your problem a governmental problem. And that's what we did. We sued them, we brought them to court, we had more than 300 publications in a period of 10 months against them. And we even had the German Chancellor Schroeder, who visited Sofia and had a lecture with, student, with students, to say, I see no political or economic reason to license the internet, for which the German friends from ISOC were like, wow, we wish he said that in Germany. <laughs> so I think, I think we, we understand this issue about internet governance as necessarily a problem. We say somebody's going to lose, the current model's going to lose if governments are involved. No, governments should and have to be involved because this is part of the infrastructure. And no government can say, I don't control the internet in my own territory. There is no such government. The US controls the internet if they want, as we know from past experience, they could go and the Congress can issue statements or they can subpoena somebody and then they will control whatever they want. And the Russian government or the Bulgarian government or any government has control over the national legislation and that's what decides what happens within the borders. But Philippe Revere mentioned the Westphalian model and um, there is a very nice article and I recommend you guys read it uh, to, for, from a guy who actually spoke at the CSIS last year. He's the Estonian president, so if you go to president.ee and go to his speeches of June 8th last year, just find this speech and read it because it, it's the essence of what the internet could be. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, you get the last word. All right. <clears throat> well, I think the, in, in one way, the single most important issue with respect to internet governance is to try to prevent the internet from falling subject to intergovernmental control. It's, it's quite clear, as Vinny just said, it is subject to national control in every, uh, every nation, um, but 
it is to try to prevent it from, be, from falling subject to intergovernmental control. Um, now, this seems like a very defensive and kind of status quo proposition in terms of uh, policy. But the point, I think, is to provide more time, more space for the Internet to continue to develop, to continue to evolve uh, in, in an organic way. And I think as that happens, the advantages of it, the, the material advantages, the cultural advantages, the social advantages, and so forth, um, continue to expand out uh, to all the people on the face of the earth. And over time, I think it's going to make it much harder for authoritarian regimes, regimes that for whatever set of reasons are, are fearful about the free flow of ideas uh, to, uh, to basically uh, assert uh, control.